There's one person who thinks about philanthropy. Our next discussion panel will talk about exactly that. Now, we've come to know a lot about this next gentleman. Uh, we know, for example, that Ola Alvarsson, chairman and founder of uh, Results, we also know that he is a world kickboxing champion. But did you know that he started SIME, which is a social impact event, really, which brings together technologists, it brings together entrepreneurs, and they then mixed with social entrepreneurs and NGOs. And essentially what he's going to be talking about today, along with his panel, is philanthropy in tech. So please put your hands together for them. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if this is working. Well, I'm back here. I promise you for the last time for today. Uh, I want to play a little game with you to see how important technology is. The first alternative is that you wake up tomorrow morning and you don't have any pinky. Okay, the pinky's gone. No pain, nice scar, but it's gone. That's alternative one. Alternative two is that you can never use a mobile phone again in your life. So the ones that want to keep the pinky, put a pinky up. So okay, we're, we're, we're all, oh, so there's one pinky here. The rest loves their mobile phones more than their body parts. I'm not gonna try with the hand or other things. So we can make technology that is better than human bodies. But can we make technology make it better for humanity? And I think we can. And I think there's a large opportunity where tech entrepreneurs meets doing good. And I think it's a business opportunity. And that's what we're gonna explore now. And we're gonna invite three speakers. And one of them, Daniela, he's uh, founded Job Me Too. He's deaf. And Job Me Too is a recruitment site for disabled people, started out of Italy. So if he doesn't answer the, uh, uh, the, the question fast, it's because I, my lip reading, I, I speak bad. So it's my fault, not his fault. So we're going to invite Daniele. We're going to invite Tom Hooper from Third Space Learning that has created a business out of helping kids become better in school. And last but not least, we're going to invite Jude back from PlayMob, who is using gamification to make the world a little bit better. So without further ado, please welcome up Jude, Daniele, Tom, come up, all of you. And uh, here, please, and we have an interpreter, Daniele, Jude, Tom, and I can sit. I'm like Oprah Winfrey here. It's very nice. Yeah. So uh, do we have a clicker? So the clicker. Where's the clicker? Uh, this is the clicker. Here you go. So please start. I'm very sorry, I can't speak uh, in English for you. My father have, has traveled around the world and he speaks uh, four languages. Well, and this problem of mine has influenced very much uh, um, all my life. These figures represent a considerable social and economic problem. I'd like to point out that these figures are not characteristic only for Italy, because they are actual for all the world. Because we see that all over the world, there's a lot of companies that prefer to pay fines, and they do not employ in such a way, disabled persons. Mm. 
but um, fortunately, uh, since um, a couple of years, we have a legal reference, an important document, which uh, has to do with disabled persons and their employment. And so, a disabled person is not any more a load or a problem for society uh, because uh, these persons are able to work. And so, the foundation of our company of Job Me Too uh, has been a very important message. It's a kind of uh, employment agency focused exclusively on disabled persons. And the fact of having been founded by a deaf person was very important and innovatory as well. These are some growing figures. Uh, because uh, we know very well that quantities uh, lead to quality. Because we have to do, we deal with uh, just fragile persons that may have uh, different kinds of problems and they should be protected. And we have invested a lot in web accessibility. Because nowadays we can't say that uh, web uh, networks are entirely accessible for everybody. So our message is uh, investing in uh, accessibility means uh, social and economic advantages. Thank you uh, very much. I'll, I'd like to cut in a little bit there because what Danielle is doing is actually taking a tremendous asset of smart people with capabilities where 75% has not been con able to contribute. Uh, what you're doing in third space learning, you are taking another untapped asset, all the kids that don't learn what they should in school, and you teach them. Could you tell me what that is about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Tom Hooper. I'm the founder of Third Space Learning. Um, uh, what we do fundamentally comes down to supply and demand and, and the imbalances in that. Um, we recruit graduates from around the world and then we use technology to connect them to children in schools across England. Now the purpose of this is to make one-to-one -one support available to the many, many children overwhelmingly from poor backgrounds who are failing. But how would that work? Would there be like an Indian A student somewhere that teaches a... So as an example, we have, we have an office in India. We employ 70 people out there. They are trained in the national curriculum. They work from our office every day. And then they log into our technology to connect them to over 100 schools and over 1,000 children each week to teach them. And it's a very simple proposition child and, and tutor put their headset on and they talk through topics that the teacher has selected. So actually the means of learning is centuries old. It's one-to-one -one communication, conversation, highly effective, high impact, but what we're doing allows us to scale at a, at a, in a kind of unique format. 
slash the price and directly plug this into the school education system. Yeah, because you're not selling this to rich parents, you're selling no. it to schools so that anybody can access it that has a exactly. need for it. The majority of children don't get one-to-one, -one, right? The way we can de deliver this with the most impact is by plugging it into the education system. There are billions of pounds in England which is being directed toward children from poor backgrounds to help plug the social inequality gap. Right? Poor numeracy costs our economy 20 billion pounds a year. And I think this is- So this 20 is, billion is because people are bad at math. Exactly. Now, we, we tend to dismiss things like maths as, oh, you know, I, I hated maths at school. But this is essential. In terms of higher welfare costs and lost productivity, that's 20 billion pounds a year. Okay, this poor numeracy, and it applies to education in general, but numeracy in particular has major social and economic consequences. So from our point of view, if we can tap global supply to meet unmet demand in the UK education system, we can solve social problem, ec economic problem, and we can also make a good return in, in, in the meantime. So to answer that point on business model, Schools pay us 500 pounds per child to provide weekly one-to-one -one support. So uh, a lot of people say that school is not fun, it's not uh, entertaining enough, and the same can be say, uh, said about a lot of charities. Uh, you created a, a company that uses the power of gaming. Could you, for the ones that weren't part of your previous session, could you just explain what Playmob is doing? Um, hi, my name's Jude, I'm the founder of Playmob. Uh, we're a platform that connects games to charities. So as people are playing, um, they're fundraising and supporting charities at the same time. Um, but as well as being able to fundraise for great causes, they're able to learn about the causes too. So in a way, it's tangential learning. Um, because the games that we use are existing games, so games like um, Angry Birds, um, Sim Social, um, RuneScape, so games where you've got millions of people playing on a daily basis. Um, so we're tapping into communities and pulling together people power and play power to be able to raise more money to do good, but also teach them about social issues at the same time. But how could that be in, a, in, a, in an Angry Birds setting? What can you do with Angry Birds and charity? So we've just recently, um, we, we launched a campaign three, well, four weeks ago with, with Rovio. Um, the campaign went on for three weeks in Angry Birds Epic, um, two million players a day. And we raised, um, through selling one item in the game, there was a, a bundle that was created for, for charity and it was supporting Room to Read. Um, so we raised $90,000 in three weeks, um, just by people being aware of this item, being able to buy it, and it raised, was raising awareness of the need for building schools and delivering books to um, children in Africa and India. Um, and what, what we do as a company as well, so we track, um, we track the item sales in real time, we quantify it all, so we know either how many books we're delivering, how many schools we're building, I mean, $90,000 for a room to read builds three schools in Africa. Um, so we can quantify that back to the, the players. Um, so they feel good because they've been part of doing something amazing. Um, and the more of that we can do, the more impact we can make either. But is, is it okay to play around with, with things as serious as charity? Let's say there is a Haiti, there, there's people you know, dying and it's, it's terrible. Could you sort of raise money with games? Have, do you ever get that question? Well, it's, I mean, it's a similar thing as, you know, if you want to do a fun run or a marathon or, you know, there's, people are raising money in all sorts of ways, whether it be baking cakes and doing stuff in your church hall to um, do things that are sports or, or dressing up, you know, to do, to do a fun run, that sort of thing. So it's basically taking that model online and scaling it mm -hmm. um, in a playful way. And we, um, no, there, there has been no backlash. I mean, the gaming industry is really coming, coming together to do good because there is such a huge amount of people that we can leverage. Um, and if we can lev leverage them to fundraise, we could also help them understand why these causes need help now mm. um, and hopefully try, try and solve some of them at the same time. Mm. Uh, uh, last, uh, I'll, uh, I want to ask Daniele, disabled people, is that an underused resource? Disabled people. Is that an underused resource? Is, is that a resource that can be used more? Well, it's an important resource that is not used sufficiently. Mm -hmm.
but if a disabled person, uh, thanks to accessibility, can solve the problem of uh, their own destiny? Uh, is it also a good business opportunity? Well, job me too uh, could be a classical example of a good combination of uh, business and social advantages. Do, do, do you think that uh, business in technology, are we becoming more and more good? My hypothesis is that with transparency, it's much more difficult to be an asshole. And if you do good things, it's like a tattoo that follows you for the rest of your life. Or if you do bad things, uh, and that impacts politicians, that impacts companies, and I think that there is sort of a new, there is a new business f philosophy being created. Before, when I started doing business, everybody wanted to exploit the planet. Now a lot of people want to enhance the planet, maybe even save the planet. But I don't know if it's only me being a nice little Swede, or if you see that too. Um, yeah, yeah, I do, and I think there's a few reasons there. I think, um, I think it's never been easier and, and this, is, this is my second business. My first business I set up in 2009, so five years ago. Um, and even in that short period of time, it's become much, much easier to set up a business. Um, in every way, you know, having Dropbox to share, five, just all of these different things. Access finance, uh, well, based in London, it's, it's certainly easier. Um, which means there's less of an excuse to sit down and complain. You can do this stuff. You can get out there, and, and you can make a difference. And, and my first job out of, out of university was working in finance. And um, I still have a lot of wonderful friends who work in finance. But they, there was a lot of complaining about, you know, I don't really like this. I want to I do something else. I want to do something more creative. It's easier than it's ever been. It really is. You can set up a company on a shoestring now. And you can set up a company that makes a difference. Or oh, it doesn't make a difference. up to you. But you can do it. And I think that means people are much more proactive, much more excited. Um, but you're not um, doing it to be nice. You're doing it because it's a hell of a good business also. Yeah, absolutely. It is a good business. Um, and the business side of it's going very well. But I, and I feel I'm, I'm very, both very unapologetic about that, but also very excited about that. I, if you look at the biggest challenges we face as individuals, as governments, as, commun as communities, education, health, pensions, power, communication, right? This is, this is the stuff that we think about, talk about, debate, and worry about every day. And this is where we spend our money. And I'm talking trillions and trillions of dollars is directed toward this. And that's only going to go up. If I look at the budgets that are ring-fenced and are growing in the UK, education, health, massive investment is going to have to go into infrastructure in terms of energy. So this idea that social enterprise is somehow a niche, you know, some kind of quasi-charity is just completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It is tackling some of the biggest problems we face and going after the big biggest budgets that exist both in consumer and at government level. So I think one of the problems of social enterprise is it's been massively unambitious in terms of where it pitches itself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I hope that that's going to change. It has to change. It has to change because where's the innovation going to come from otherwise? And, and where's, uh, where, where's Playmob going to go? Fast forward, five years from now, what are you five years from now? So our, we call it our BHAG, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to raise a billion dollars for global causes online through play, all tracked and transparent. Um, so we know exactly where that money is going and, going and who it's impacted. Um, but where, where we're moving to, the interesting shift has been, we, we started off in gaming, gaming is my background, mm -hmm. and um, we've worked within gaming, within communities, within what the walls of games to, to fundraise and to raise awareness, awareness of causes. Um, but what started to happen recently is um, large corporates who are looking at, um, you know, CSR shouldn't be just a, an, an add-on. It shouldn't be an afterthought, and you shouldn't just make mm. a charitable donation to the side. You can actually weave this into the business and make it more impactful mm. for everyone, for the business, for the employees, for the customers. Mm. And that's why just the word CSR annoys me. Corporate social responsibility. Why is it corporate social opportunity? I mean, it would target the thinking in a different way. Well, that's the thing. I think companies are realizing that you know it's it's not just an add-on. It's it, it it's a necessity. It's part of their business plan. It mm. has to be. Um, 
And so where, where Playmob is going is um, we're using game mechanics in the corporate world, in non-gaming companies, um, and seeing our platform as it's, it's not just... You know, gaming is still there as, as an industry that we work in, but there's other industries that can utilize what we do to track actions and link back to socially good impact transparently and playfully as well to make it really fun. Um, and I guess one of the things that we're, um, we're really interested in as well is the rise of the millennials. You know, by 2025, 75% of the global workforce will be millennials. Mm. And, and they're, they're gamers. They're, they're, well, they're not just gamers, but they're socially conscious. Yeah, you yeah. Know, they, we call them the Tom Shoes generation. You know, they, um, they're the most so socially conscious generation mm -hmm. of, of, of us all. And they, they look for companies that have, are making social impact. They won't mm. buy from companies that won't are not making an impact and they won't work for companies that are not socially conscious. Mm. Um, so it's even more important now that companies make changes to their business plans to become more socially conscious to gear up for the new, for the millennials. You, you should start extending the games to the stock exchange. That's the game that you should also... Well, exactly, yeah. I mean, ha have, asked the, um, have asked the agency, I've done a, have mapped already meaningful brands against the stock market. Mm. And brands that are meaningful, um, outperform the stock market by 120%. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, if we could apply gaming to that, could we make that more impactful? Yeah, so being good could actually be a very good business. And I, uh, I have a friend who used to be the HR director of HP, and she's now uh, the HR director at Ericsson. They have some 200,000 employees. And she said that the millennials ask a different question than my generation. We asked, uh, what are you doing and how are you doing it? Uh, and please hire me, I've done this. The millennials, they say, why are you doing what you're doing? And why should I work for you? So the why becomes much more important, and that brings us back to, to purpose. Unfortunately, time is running out, so we have to end this excellent panel. Thank you very much to Daniele. Thank you very much, both of you. And you'll be around so we can engage in, in conversation afterwards. This is the last time you'll see me. Thank you very much. <laughs>